I'm very excited to be here uh, moderating this, the CEO keynote this year. We have a terrific group of panelists. I think you're really going to enjoy what I think is a very rich topic, which is the cloud and the way it's changing the way we do business. Let me introduce the panelists briefly, and then we'll dive right into the discussion. Bill Barney, as you know, is CEO of Global Cloud Exchange. Uh, Global Cloud Exchange has one of the largest fiber carriers in the world, with particular strength in Asia and the emerging markets. Bill has also been a visionary in this space, uh, launching the CloudX platform in October last year. Um, and as you heard in his remarks, thinking about where uh, the cloud uh, is going in terms of carrier perspectives. Steve Smith is CEO of Equinix, with over 100 data centers in 30 plus markets in 15 countries, if I've got that right. Equinix has a truly global perspective on customer demand. Steve has also been a thought leader in the industry, launching the Equinix Cloud Exchange and uh, including this morning announcing a new acquisition that's gonna help them with their cloud strategy. It was nice of you to provide us some new content for the panel this morning, hot off the press. Um, and no panel is complete without a hot startup. John Young is the founder and CEO of AppCara. Uh, let's see, could we go back two slides? There we go. Maybe someone can help should, us. Should come up down there. All right. Um, Bill's next to last slide talked about cloud orchestration, and John's company is a great example of cloud orchestration. Um, he's got a number of large carriers as clients, and so here you have on the panel this morning a perspective coming from the fiber world, from the data center world, and from the software world, but all approaching this problem uh, from their own particular backgrounds. So without any more ado, let's jump into it. I might start, Steve, in your keynote here last year, you talked about the cloud as a major paradigm shift. A year has gone by, you know, how fast is it happening? Well, it's, it's uh, good morning to everybody and, and thanks for having us today. It, it, I would describe it as shifting at a faster rate than we probably could have predicted a year or two years ago, uh, as Bill alluded to in, in his opening comments. We, um, from our perspective at Equinix, uh, our, our role, is, as most of you know in this room, is to get in the middle of it and help accelerate the commercial development of big trends like cloud. And it's not the only trend, as, as Bill said, that's, that's spinning out there fast. And I think if you look back 35 years to the development of the PC, I've not seen a time where there's so many trends with mobile and social and cloud and the other big data and internet of things that are accelerating and spinning at the same time at a rate that's causing the world to change faster than most companies are, are really realizing. So, but, but with particular to cloud, we have definitely seen the cloud unfold in our data centers all over the world in the biggest markets in the world, and it's the biggest public cloud players putting access nodes and, and service nodes all around the world, not just with Equinix, but with many data center providers. And so we're, we see a world of where the historically the network service providers that, are, that have enabled Equinix to do what we've done for a while now are being peered up with cloud service providers. And so the service provider world today, for, from our view, includes both cloud service providers and network service providers, and the growth on the cloud side is enormous. But the networks are there in the middle of it, and they're facilitating, and it's a, it's a multi-cloud environment. It's a very exciting time. As we talk to enterprises, though, and as you look at compute today, the vast majority of it is still sitting in-house at corporations themselves. And while people have a desire to move it into the cloud, it's not always as easy as we think. I don't, John, do you want to talk a little bit about your perspective on some of the barriers to adoption? Sure. No, I think it would be interesting to look at uh, from the perspective of uh, an end user, the enterprise, right? I see that there's a major shift between buying patterns and also who's taking control in those buying decisions in the last five years, right? In the last, no, five years ago, when you look at IT, it's mostly set up to have uh, an application group and infrastructure group. The application group, if they want to spin up a server to deploy application, they need to apply and get approval and so on. Right, but the, the changes uh, you know, from our engagement in the last year mm -hmm. has shifted to the application group is taking a lot more control, right, in terms of de deploying because it's so easy now. So that the focus is mostly on the application that uh, you know, focus on driving return on value. Well, I, think, I think this all sounds good in, you know, in theory, but th talk about a couple of examples, like actual problems that your customers are solving, or the applications they're using as these initial sort of cases for the cloud. We gotta make this, you know, I don't know. Me? 
Well, I, I think like a lot of the enterprise, whether it's a pharmaceutical or any vertical industry um, you know, areas, right? That um, you know, for those enterprise to set up like the infrastructure, even in the cloud, that you can buy compute capacity on demand. That setting up the software and able to run jobs for a short period, like hours or days, and then collect the results, and then you don't no longer need the application anymore. Like being able to orchestrate applications set to set up and tear down in a fast manner really help them to drive efficiency, right? Uh, cloud solve probably 50% of the problem, so you can launch server really fast, but ultimately what you need to do is to run apps. Um, other cases or examples that you think people should have in mind as they think about the early cases? Yeah, well, I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I, I was gonna uh, just add on what John's saying. I, I think w when we look at enterprises and and at Equinix, we've accumulated roughly 1,000 enterprises over 15 years. And just to put that into perspective, and, and as everybody in this room knows, we're all pursuing uh, the enterprise. Everybody's going after all these industry verticals that we call the enterprise to help service them and administer them and help them get to the cloud and, and other compute uh, and application services. Um, we've accumulated about 1,000 enterprises as customers in 15 years. There's another. 340 to 350,000 companies out there today called enterprises that are over 10 million in sales, US dollars sales, and have at least 500 people in the company, which arguably would be a, a prospect for anybody in this room. So there's plenty of market out there to go service. And so the, the, I, don't, I don't think any of us would argue that everybody in this room is running their companies to try to service the enterprise and help them for certain parts of their application workload to go to the cloud for performance reasons, security reasons, uh, network congestion reasons, et cetera. And so we see lots of examples of, of customers moving portions of their application workload um, to, to this environment. And, and in today, what we're creating inside of our data centers is the public environment, obviously, with all the network service providers, and in, in many cases, a private environment with directly, directly to the cloud service provider so that you have choice. And if you're a CIO and, and you're managing 1,000 applications, and you decide to put a certain portion of that workload into an environment to get access to the cloud providers, you can do it privately or publicly. And that's, that's the multi-cloud environment mm -hmm. we're seeing unfold in these data centers. And it's driven by the, big, by the big players, you know, the big three, no question about it, AWS, Microsoft, Azure, and, and Google, and very closely behind IBM SoftLayer and Oracle and SAP and VMware and Cisco. They're all running to do the same thing from what we see in our centers to put access nodes out there so that when enterprises put distributed workload around the world, they can see them and directly connect into them in an as-a-service model for certain parts of the workload. And how uh, is that playing out in some of the emerging markets where you have a large customer base? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably going to be the challenge for the next couple of years, which is, you know, the broadband capabilities. Uh, I mean, cloud is, is uh, so we have customers in, in Western Europe and, and the United States, and I think uh, the adoption is extremely rapid. Uh, I think the the challenge is when you talk to an Indian CIO or a Middle Eastern CIO, it's a little bit slower. And I think part of that is just because of the access speeds are, are slower. Um, you don't have as much wireless capability around, so you can't actually uh, leave the premises as easily as you can in the, in the United States. And also just the sophistication of, of the apps that right now are, are, are somewhat behind. But, so I think in the emerging markets it's different. But I think cloud plays a different role in, in the emerging markets because I think it actually is a much bigger consumer play. And I think one of the things that we're going to see, I think, in, in the emerging markets is that consumers will be able to get on with cloud services uh, for $100 a, a terminal. They'll be actually able to access the internet. And so when you think about digital divide and that 2 billion people, uh, we will see that the consumer will be the beneficiary of cloud, I think, in, in, uh, in places like India and, and Western China and places where there's uh, low-income individuals. So I think it's, it, will be, it will impact the emerging markets, but mm -hmm. probably not as much in the enterprise space. Sorry for the long answer. No, no, that's, that's great. <laughs> Look, I, the desire for people to tap directly into the big three and other cloud computing networks is clearly a rising trend. And I think if we had one more seat on the panel, it would be someone for the OTT perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about how the rise of the OTT players and those big cloud compute um, providers is affecting your business. Partners, competitors, what's that relationship like? Let me start. <laughs> well, it's, it's multidimensional. Um, and I think as most people know in this room, 
you know, most of the network service providers have some data center capacity. They've got you know, application offerings. They've got <coughs> network offerings, service offerings, et cetera. So I think in the world we live in today, we're going to compete a little bit around the edges. We're going to partner with each other. You know, from our perspective, we've been pretty much in the 15 and a half years that we've been around a, a direct face-to-face -face with our customers. And as you saw, if you saw the announcement this morning, the world is changing at such a rapid pace that we as, uh, are, are starting to also develop an indirect capability. So we're developing a channel capability at Equinix for the first time in 15 and a half years. And also we're developing a professional services capability. We, we have learned over the last 18 months as we have these cloud conversations that our customers are saying, I get, I get the architectural perspective. I, do, I see what your 100 data centers can do for me. I want to put stuff in Asia, Europe in, in a distributed fashion in the Americas. Do you have some people that can help me build the plan? Right. I need a 30, 60, 90 day assessment to help me build the plan. I may use Equinix at the end of the day, but I, I may not. But do you have people that can help me? Because I, I buy into what you're talking to us about. So we've made the decision to, and we announced this morning, a pretty small firm, 30, roughly 30 employees, that is fronting AWS and Microsoft today with helping companies blueprint to get to the cloud. And so we've decided to move in that direction, have that capability in-house, partnered with our channel and our direct sales force to go facilitate people getting to the multi-cloud environment. Totally. Well, your question, OTT competitors or threats, I think they're, uh, uh, the reality is they've, if you look at the successful OTT players, they've figured out how to actually make money on the internet. So the first group of guys that came through did not necessarily make a lot of money. These guys have actually figured out how to monetize them and have done it extremely well. I actually think there'll be more players like this. So we, we think of it the big three. My guess is there'll be a, a big 10 uh, or a big 15. The, way, the great thing about cloud computing is it levels the playing field for many small startups to accelerate into this. And I think we'll see that there'll be a lot more little companies getting big fast. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen. Uh, I, he's in Silicon Valley all the time, but the reality is we see startups go from zero to a million users or 10 million users or 20 million users yep. in, in a matter of months where it used to take years to get there. And I think that's gonna be the big difference. And, and uh, you know, so Google has got a good start, but I yeah. think there'll be guys catching up soon. And uh, I think it's gonna be an interesting time. Well, I can give you a, well, a good data point to, to support that just from the perspective we have. Um, we have almost 5,000 customers at Equinix around the world in that time we've been in business. And uh, roughly 1,000 network service providers has customers. Um, and everybody in this room knows what we do for them. Just in the last two years, we've accumulated almost 1,200 cloud and IT service provider type customers. So customers that used to be managed services providers that now call themselves cloud hosting companies, et cetera. But just think about that. In 15 years, we accumulated 1,000 networks as customers, enabling them to do cell services in our facilities. In the last two years, 1,200 plus, and we, we categorize them with IT service providers and pure play cloud providers. We probably have close to 500 pure play cloud providers that are exactly what Bill just described. Small companies, medium-sized companies. Some will make it, some won't make it. So there'll be some consolidation. But if you just get your head around that to think how many people have come out of nowhere to get into this business, it gives you the order magnitude of what's going on and how fast it's going on. Yeah, I'll offer one other statistic in here for people. In, in the US, uh, capital spending on IT is now $1 in every four of CapEx is spent by the private sector. So 600 billion a year, still majority spent by people doing it themselves. So the size of this spend as it begins to move out and into the data centers and onto the fiber networks is just an enormous amount you know, of spend. Um, it means a lot more traffic too. We yep. saw the 8K TV yesterday. We hear about a lot of this. You've talked a little bit about a golden age of fiber. Yep. Tell, tell me a little bit more about how you see that coming to play and is the cloud helping that or not? Well, I mean, I, we didn't get a chance to, I was rushing through my slides there, but I think one <laughs> of the, we're both originally computer guys. He's an EDS guy yeah. and I was a sort of a Unix guy many, many years ago. And I think the, uh, the interesting thing is we're, we sit between the terminal, the end user now uses terminals, everything, if you look at everyone in this, 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 uh, this room, they're probably using some form of terminal in the computer right. somewhere else. And uh, what connects that? It's either high-speed wireless or glass. 
and we sit between. So that, that's when I say it's the golden age of fiber, we become the bus inside a computer, uh, and I think we will be for quite a while, which I think is a, is a huge opportunity for uh, fiber operators. I think it'll mean that there'll be a lot more building, there'll be a lot more focus there, and I think there'll be a lot more focus on wireless as well. So I think LTE and a lot of these technologies will, will get a lot more focus over the next couple of years because they're going to have to. They're going to become, it's no longer does this data, maybe is it important to me? Did I get my news? It's now I can't actually run my application to go to work because it's, uh, I'm running over this network. So it becomes a much different network experience, I think, going forward. Well, I think we've given a good landscape of where we are today and some of the dynamics, but I know people want to hear us look into the crystal ball a little bit as we look down the road. So you opened with the Steve Jobs quote. He also talked a lot about uh, not just developing what his customers were asking for, but developing products that the customers didn't know they want yet. As you think about products and services that you're looking to roll out over time, are you doing this, to what extent are you doing it in response to things you're hearing from your customers? And to what extent are you thinking about, you know, we've got a lead here with things that people may not know, you know, that they want? What? Should I? Sure, please. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the buying pattern will continue to change from the enterprise side. Now, we're really seeing that like, in the next three to five years, like, enterprise will not be buying data center space, network, and all those to build their own cloud and lay software on top of it. But they more like they want to buy application to support how many users. And those, uh, those applications can be distributed across multiple geography, which make the network very important. Right? So they, they, you know, the buying is going to be more on application by application base, and the, and you know, the only difference, I think, is going to be you know, whether the application is shared, like SaaS, or is dedicated to one customer. I, I think the way we look at the future is, is, is driven by customers that really probably can't look any further than 12 to 18, maybe 24 months out, and see what their customers are telling them and where they see the world going. Yep. So we spend a lot of time dealing with our partners and customers in this room thinking about where, where the world is evolving to. And it's, it's, it's changing in a lot of ways. I mean, half of our workforce today is, are, are millennials, right? They're people in that, in that age group. So the, the user and the people we're dealing with today is certainly shifting away from our time frame. Yeah. Um, and, and it's shifting sure. fast, and it's social, and it's mobile, <laughs> and it's cloud-based, and it's, it's got a lot of big data. And so I think the combination of all those, we see the requirements from everybody we talk to having to think about those. Most CIOs today are having to solve for all of those initiatives with how they're deploying their, their infrastructure. And I think Bill said in the beginning is absolutely true, is the world is, has changed from, you can't run today a, four, a global 2000 company with a centralized infrastructure. Those days are gone. Your employees are distributed around the world, your revenue is distributed around the world, your customers are distributed around the world. And I, I think we're gonna continue to benefit, all of us, from the fact that, that if you have capacity and you have application capability and you have network capability distributed around the planet, you're going to be able to catch business all over you and, and, and people are going to win in that, in that environment. Tell me a little bit, you know, as you look ahead and thinking about where to go with the new services and products. Well, I think I, we're, we're more thinking about infrastructure. I think, the, uh, I think as we get into the, the new world, I think we're going to chase power. I think we're going to chase, uh, you know, as we start thinking about infrastructure, I think, uh, you know, countries that have three cents a, a kilowatt versus a country that's got 20 cents a kilowatt. When you have a network, you can start to move computing in different directions. So as a carrier in that, you know, that wholesale space, I think it's going to uh, change how we build networks. And we think it's going to be, there's going to be a lot more focus on the developing markets versus the developed. And, and uh, those are going to be the harder places to actually go, and that's where enterprises are going to struggle the most, uh, we believe. So, because they're going to be chasing consumers, uh, mm -hmm. most of the consumers are in the emerging markets, and the infrastructure is way behind. And yeah. so, cloud actually enables a lot of those opportunities to happen. I think that's where, you know, from our perspective, obviously we're going to compete in, in the United States and Europe, but also a special emphasis for us will be on how do we actually get into those emerging markets. Bob, another, another thought around that topic yeah. is I, I think the, the, the theme at Davos a year ago was hyperconnectivity. And, and I, I, I firmly believe that as we think about going forward that the, because of the choice out there in this multi-cloud, hybrid cloud environment that we're all talking about, that right. we see unfolding around the world, that the hyper-connectivity required to run your companies today right. is, is a theme that's not going to go away. I mean, interconnection or whatever you want to call it, people connecting mm -hmm. to each other to run their businesses yeah. is not going away and it's accelerating. And, and we can see it every day in our, in our business, and I'm sure Bill sees it every day, 
And, and the great thing about being in the business that we're all in together, we're in the, we're in the heart of that. We all, you know, whether you're a data center provider or a network provider or an application provider, it, it's all going to get interconnected in some form or fashion. And the people that are thinking ahead of that in the next generation of interconnection are the people that are going to really position to win. One of the themes that I've heard on the tip of the tongue with people is talking about security and the extent to which either real or perceived fears there are causing people to sort of drive with one foot on the brake and one on the gas as they go through this shift. Um, a lot of that is application security or data security, but how big a role does that play in your businesses and what you're talking to your customers about? Well, I think security is absolutely, uh, um, you know, we look at Snowden, it was a spectacular, uh, you know, situation, but I think, you know, the reality is no one wants anyone reading their stuff, right? And it's a, so it's an important, it's an important piece. I think the, the, it's, it's sort of like playing goalkeeper in soccer, though. If uh, you don't hear about it, it means that you're doing a pretty good job. And I think the uh, reality is we've done a pretty good job in terms of security uh, for networks in general. I, I think we've had two or three you know, spectacular blow-ups, and, and the rest it's been, you know, for the amount of network that's now in, in the public domain, we've done a very good job, I think, in terms of security. But I think it's going to be an area that we're going to keep focusing on. I think it's, it's probably it's one of those things that, a, you don't get paid a lot for, but you get in a lot of trouble if it doesn't work. And yeah. it's a, uh, so that's where I, you know, I think every network operator has to think about this going forward. Yeah, I agree. I think, it's, I think it's, over the last 18 months, it's risen to definitely one of the top three concerns with cost and performance. And then, and then it extends to the whole cybersecurity world that we're operating in now. Certainly people in this room are protecting a lot of companies from, from the terrible environments that we've read about over the last 12 months in the the difficult situations. And I would guess, as I think about the future, that cybersecurity is going to become a top priority for every company on the planet, uh, protecting their information, given what we've observed with these, you know, handful of companies that have had very tough situations. And, you know, in the, 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 you think about our world, or particularly where you grew up, you think about the world of we try to make it easier for our users to get to all the applications in your company. So we built single sign-on. We made it really easy to get to your internal applications. Well, guess what? <laughs> the world's changing now and making it really easy for the bad guys to get into your networks is not a good thing anymore. And I think we're going to be thinking about how long do we want to store our emails? You know, where do you park them? I think there's going to be a whole change in the next 12, 14, 18 months on how we run our companies, protecting the information that we're, we're moving around the world for our customers um, in a much faster way than we expected a year ago. Well, we have just a couple minutes left here. Are there any final thoughts you want to offer? But I also thought we might open it up to the audience to the extent that you've got questions for the panel this morning. Questions? I have a bunch more, so, you know, don't be shy. Yes? Their, their country. So what is going to, uh, how can you ensure that when you have a distributed network and distributed data centers that data that needs to stay in country A stays in country A and ha is not accessible or will somehow be backed up in another country? I think it's, yeah, it's one of the biggest challenges because the, uh, the segregation, I mean the regulators are, are becoming very, very active in this space, especially in the banking sector where they, they want data to stay resident in the, uh, the country. So no, no, it's a, uh, it's a big issue and, and what, what constitutes data that has to stay because there's uh, emails, there's all sorts of traffic that goes on a network that may or may not pertain to that. So no, it's, it's probably one of the bigger issues and the governments are, are probably the most active. Uh, I've seen more in the last 12 months, not only on just uh, storage of data but even trying to tax different types of applications as well. So I mean, one of the biggest issues that we have is, as we get into the cloud space is that governments also want to tax if the cloud computing is in India and you're actually paying for it in the United States, does the Indian tax ban get a piece of this? So there's going to be a lot of uh, governments, not only where things are resident, but also how, how the governments interact with, with uh, us. And it's going to be, I think, a very different regulated environment over the next couple of years as they, they take their, as they look at these things. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I would agree with what Bill's saying. I think it's a great question. I think it's rank, it ranks right up there with, with the security conversation, the privacy conversation of information. And from our view, we, we've been playing and, and operating this environment for many years since we operate in 15 countries. And so you couldn't, first of all, we have to buy by the rules in that country and the laws in that country. And, and you can't operate there if you can't provide that kind of, that kind of service to your customer. But it's a, it's a much higher pro, uh, discussion with our customers today. So if you're in Switzerland or Germany or Singapore, wherever you are, 
you can bet that the conversation with those co local customers that are putting server infrastructure and storage arrays in, that, in a local data center, that they don't want people having access to that stuff from another country, or particularly if you're an American multinational service provider. So top of mind priority, something we have to, to, we have to first of all, live by legally and, and make sure that our customers understand that we're facilitating that. And so generally, we benefit from that because of having 100 data centers in 15 countries and 32 of the biggest cities we can facilitate that for a local customer pretty easily. Compliance tends to come with budget. And so people not only need to actually protect the data, but they need to comply with the rules. And we've seen a rise, at least in my business, of businesses that help people comply with the rising regulation here. I think that will be a big spend and, in fact, a big opportunity for yes. people. All right, we have time for one more. Yes. So uh, we all love the cloud, no question about that. Um, but uh, I'm just curious, the CEO perspective, particularly from an uh, interconnection operator, um, the cloud in a way, if you think about uh, Porter Five Forces type of analysis of the industry, um, consolidates buying power into a handful of a few over the top players to the point that Bill brought up on the earlier slide about kind of the increasing value and consolidation. Um, and that's kind of a threat if you're an interconnection operator in the sense that, you know, in the worst case, there's only one provider and you can be disintermediated. So even though we love the cloud, to what extent do you think that kind of that's a negative factor? And then the second thing would be, um, you know, everyone seems to believe that all IT moves to the cloud. And I think I proved six or seven years ago that hybrids were optimal and that, um, Kind of to your point, Robert, around kind of where the uh, where the spend is. A majority of it is still in private data centers, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And that if you look at any other industry, you know the ownership model is often um, overweighted relative to the on-demand pay-per-use model. So curious about thoughts on kind of the ultimate end state. Is it? you know, one cloud provider, several cloud providers, or the end state is really a continuing hybrid that includes both uh, private data centers that are interoperating with uh, public ones? Oh, that's a pretty detailed question. <laughs> so, <laughs> do the OTT <laughs> providers have a lot of market power, and will it all be cloud? I guess I heard. Yeah, well, I can get, I'll, I'll give you a point of view uh, based on the, you know, the, the view we have. Um, First of all, I do think the multi-cloud is, the hybrid cloud, whatever you want to call it, is going to be the, the, the next paradigm shift that we're going to be operating in. And I personally haven't been around this industry not quite as long as this guy, but <laughs> I, I, I was around during the mainframe. And I think this is just the next decade of paradigm shift. When, when I went from mainframe to mini, as Bill said, and we went to client server, and then we went to the desktop, now the compute model is going to this, to this thing called cloud computing. It's the next paradigm shift. So will all applications go to the cloud? Of course not. We have, I'll give you an example, we have a Fortune 50 company, probably a Fortune 20 company, that has 9,000 applications that runs this company globally. And they're gonna move 1,000 of those applications to the cloud this year. So I think it varies by customer, it varies by workload, and most companies have a two or three tiered workload in their application. And, and you know, initially I think people were worried about, well, they'll, they'll just use the, they'll move the back office applications first in test and development. And I can tell you, absolutely, we're seeing mission critical, performance, latency dependent applications moving to the cloud today. Cost reasons, security reasons, um, uh, all, all the reasons that the previous three decades of compute changes happened. So it's going to happen. Um, will they be interconnected? Um, data point, we, in, in the last 18 months at our company, uh, I told you we've gathered over 1,200 uh, cloud related service provider players and probably over 10,000 cross-connects associated with customers trying to connect into those cloud providers. So in a, in a matter of the last six to 12 months, we've accumulated that many, that many interconnections trying to connect to those clouds privately, publicly, et cetera. So is it happening? I think so. You know, we have sort of an interesting perspective in that we're in the middle of it and we're enabling a lot of it. So I, I, when you start seeing that trend and for you know, our, our little company that's that you guys know the size of it is, it has 140,000 cross connects around the world enabling all this interconnection. And in the last six to eight months, we've accumulated 10,000 interconnections going to these cloud providers. Tells you something's going on. And, and, and it's primarily driven what Bob said. It's driven by the big ones today, you know, the big three and then follows closely by the next 10. 
But it's happening and there's going to be a lot of winners in the, with the small to medium businesses and certainly the share takers now are, are very strong and dominant today and people are going to use those, those services. Uh, and I think customers, just our little company uses 40 cloud service providers to run our IT in our company. So you know, generally a, a two and a half billion dollar US company around the world uses 40 cloud providers to run our IT. Now we're probably a little bit forward leaning in terms of that environment, but that's where the world's going to go. Great. Well, thank you. I have a big round of applause for our panel this morning. Thank you for being here.